Uh, I just want to speak to, uh, uh, I, I don't know if you guys know, every week we've got a big audience that's tuning in, watching online, and, and there's a really specific segment of our online audience that I want to speak to today, all right? Um, it's not the segment that uh, should stay home because, frankly, there's just a segment of you guys that, that, man, because of COVID, you should be at home and you're doing the right thing, and we, and we affirm that decision wholeheartedly. But there's another segment of you that are at home right now, and I, I want to be a little bit gentle with you, but, but not too gentle, okay? There's some of you that are sitting at home right now in your pajamas, eating your Fruit Loops or, well, I don't know, your cereal of choice, right? And you've been saying to yourself for three weeks now, you know, next week I'll go, Right? And then Sunday morning rolls around, and you've gotten kind of used to coming to church in your pajamas. And you think, well, next Sunday I'll come. And I just want to tell you, like, uh, one, of our, one of our awesome sweet women who came this morning, uh, and kind of what we're seeing is every week we're open, we see a few different faces. We're starting to see some new faces. People are beginning to stick their toe in a little bit deeper and try it out, try coming and being here on purpose. One of our sweet women walking in this morning, she said, you know, it's just time. It's just time. And for some of you, uh, I, I, some of you who are kind of on the fence, right, I want to tell you, and, and uh, I always say I want to push you. I don't want to push you off the cliff, but I want to push you just the right amount. It's time to come off the fence, Man, we sang an amazing song here in person uh, this morning, uh, Lord, I Need You, right? And we're going to go online with some of this, and you're going to be able to sing along at home if you want, but you will never have the amazing experience we had this morning singing that song. Amen? All right, so I have a message for you at home. It's time, right? It's time. Can we agree with that? It's time. Yeah. Find your way here. Don't let me find my way to you, okay? It's time. Man, uh, I am excited that you're here. Uh, today we're going to wrap up our Colossians teaching series. Uh, we've been 12 weeks in Colossians, which is crazy, and, uh, and hopefully been really, really good and encouraging. Very seldom do we teach verse by verse, but we, we've almost been there through this whole series. If you brought your Bibles, I encourage you to open them up actually to Colossians chapter 4. It's the very end. The last chapter in Paul's letter to the, to the believers under the influence in the city of Colossae. In chapter 4, like so many chapters in our New Testament, the last chapter includes a list of names. Timothy and Aristarchus, Demas, Epaphras, Nympha. And like when I say these names, like you don't know who that is, right? Like I don't know who that is either. Um, it reminded me, though, this list of names at the end of, of Colossians, it reminded me of an old church song that was sung when I was a kid. It was called When the Roll is Called Up Yonder. Uh, this song was written in 1894, I think, and it's the only song I know that uses the word yonder. Like, I don't know, I don't know where else you will find that. But in the song, when the role is called up yonder, it was actually written by a guy who was uh, uh, back when they used to have this thing called Bible school. They actually like kept roll of who was there and who was not there. And this guy's friend was actually absent from Sunday school class. And that's where he got the idea to write this song. And in the end of Colossians, you see this kind of a roll call. Now, you don't know who Demas is or Nympha is or Epaphras is, probably, but the Colossians did. Like, the people this letter's written to, they knew these names, and, and like, you know your friends, like, it was tied to a really specific memory. The, the people, these people, the Colossians knew, they were friends and family, and they had helped that church and prayed for that church. It would be like when I speak to Aspen Grove, I would say, do you guys remember Clint Holloway? You remember him? Like, like, like he's not here this morning. He's at Pajama Church, I guess, you know. But like the, all of the amazing ways that Clint has served this church. And do you guys remember Pat Money Penny? Pat Money Penny, I think, is the longest standing member of Aspen Grove. And do you know that Pat Money Penny, that she has been praying for this church for more than 50 years? 
Do you remember David and Clint and Rick already mentioned, or, or, or Clint already mentioned, who stepped up to be elders at this church during a really difficult season? Do you remember the way that Emily and Lauren and Amy and Adele have loved and served our kids at this church? Do you remember how Jeremiah and Charles have wired everything in this building? Do you remember the Browns and how Bob always keeps calling, right? Do you remember uh, uh, our trustees who helped us create a budget this year? When I first came to Aspen Grove, there was this really old guy named Jay Roberson who showed up. He would just show up at the building with a toolbox to fix stuff. Do you remember the Coulters and how Kathy stood right here and led us in worship and how there's Lee's fingerprints are all over this building? Do you remember Peggy and Donna? I don't know what they did, but I remember them. I'm going to get a phone call about that one. Do you remember the Bonds and the Smiths and the Stanicks, the Rollins, the Christians, the Ostings? The herrings and, and, and so, the kissels, I mean, so many more. Like, that's what Paul is doing at the end of this letter. It's, a, it's kind of an honor roll. Like, he's calling out the people that have made such an important impact on the life of this church. Season after season, they contributed to the work of God. In the church in Colossae, they, they prayed for those people. In this honor roll, like for the Colossians, it's people that have gone before them. They've paved the way. They've made that church possible. These people are people that love the church and pray for the church still. They're part of the family. So I know maybe when you read a list of names, it may not register anything with you, but I want you to see how important these people were to the life of the church And to use language from Hebrews, since you are surrounded by such a great crowd of witnesses, of men and women who have gone before you and held you up. Look what he says in verse 2 of chapter 4. Let's just read these few verses together. Since these amazing witnesses of faith have gone before you and prayed for you and lifted you up and served your church, he says, Devote yourselves to prayer with an alert mind and a thankful heart. Let's keep going through all these. He says, and pray for us too that God will give us many opportunities to speak about his mysterious plan concerning Christ. He said, that's why I'm here in chains. He says, pray that I will proclaim this message as clearly as I should. And he gives them this commission. He says, live wisely among those who are not believers and make the most of every opportunity. And finally, really the last verse for us today, verse 6. He says, let your conversation, related to those non-believers, let your conversation be gracious and attractive so that you will have the right response for everyone. I just want to spend a few minutes looking at these verses. In verse 2, he begins with this devotion to prayer. He says, devote yourself to prayer with an alert mind. And really, that that alert mind is, is about wakefulness. Be awake. Later in chapter 4, he talks about Epaphras. He says, Epaphras always prays earnestly for you, asking God to make you strong and perfect. That devotion is like continued and steadfast, but it's a really specific kind of prayer and devotion. It's, it's a prayerfulness that is awake and thankful. That alert mind is, is about being awake in the night. Have you ever been kind of restless at night when you sleep, like hard to go to sleep? You're just kind of awake, watchful, alert, vigilant. Like this is an important idea in Christianity, especially in like in Jesus' teachings in Matthew chapter 24 and 25, near the very end, like the the penultimate, the climax of Matthew's gospel. Jesus himself, right before his death, he tells stories about 
being awake. He tells about a servant wait, waiting for his master's return. And he talks about bridesmaids waiting for the groom. Do you remember these stories? And Jesus himself says, keep watch. Be ready all the time for the Son of Man will come when least expected. And Paul tells the Colossians, and he tells us too, he says, when you pray, pray awake. Pray with a wakefulness. Pray with a, in, in a way that is always looking forward. Now, be honest, is that what your prayer life looks like? I mean, most of my prayer life is talking about today's issues or problems that I'm facing right now in this moment, right here, here we are. Here's another day of boredom in COVID world, right? Like, but he says, I want you to pray forward. The Christian is always looking forward, always has the future in mind. And because we believe in the promise of God, we know it's a better future, amen? So pray forward, pray looking forward. Be awake to the promises of God and to his return. But in verse 3, he says, look, I, I don't want you to just be awake. I want you to pray for open doors. Maybe your version says many opportunities. He says, pray for us too, that God will give us many opportunities. Literally in the Greek, it is open doors. Now, this is pretty interesting to me. Maybe you didn't catch this, but we think Paul is writing this letter to the church in Colossae while he is in prison. He's either in prison prison or he's under house arrest. Now, if you were in prison, what would you pray for? Right? Like if I was in prison, I might pray that I would be released. If I was in prison, I might pray that the chains would be taken off. I, if I was in prison, I might pray for for, for ease or comfort, I might pray for, you know, just to be let out. But Paul prays and encourages us and the Colossians to pray for something different. Like, and this is really important. He says, pray that God may open doors so that we can share the, mis the myster mysterious plan concerning Christ. In 1 Corinthians 16, 9, he said, using this exact same language, he says, there is a wide open door for a great work here. Like, even in prison, where is Paul's mind? Even in COVID, where does he invite us to have our mind and our attention? Even in prison, even in chains, he's looking for and praying for opportunities to share the truth of Jesus Christ with others. For him, the mission is always before him. Our uh, Discovery Bible study group this week read the story of uh, Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. It, it's in Acts chapter 8, if you want to go there and read it yourself. If you remember this story, there's, the, there's this Ethiopian eunuch, which uh, I, I know maybe you don't know anything about that, but I just want you to imagine the, like, the weirdest, most oddest person you could ever imagine, right? Like, like completely bizarre and different in every kind of way. And the other character in this story is Philip, who is, Philip is a great, good, you know, like Jewish guy, follows the, you know, the letter of the law to everything and God brings these two polar opposites together. Scripture tells us in Acts chapter 8 that this eunuch, this Ethiopian eunuch, has actually gone to the temple in Jerusalem to try to worship. But do you think they let him in? I doubt it. And now he's on his return trip probably a thousands of miles, Right? And somehow he's got his hands on a scroll from the Old Testament, a scroll of Isaiah. And Philip is led by the Spirit to kind of like walk beside this eunuch's chariot. Philip is a poor Jewish guy. The eunuch is incredibly wealthy. He has his own chariot. Chariot. He's actually got a scroll of Isaiah. And he's reading out loud, trying to understand it. And the Spirit of God brings these two together. Philip says, hey, do you know what you're reading? 
And this eunuch who is from a different culture, a different world, I mean, uh, as different as can be, he says, how can I know what I'm reading? How can I know? And Philip says, well, coincidentally, I'm here. I can tell you what this is about. And he shares the gospel of Jesus Christ with him. And then the eunuch asks this incredible question in Acts chapter 8. He says, why can't I be baptized? Well, the answer is there's about a million reasons why a eunuch could not be baptized, right? It was the same reasons he wouldn't have been allowed in the temple. He would have been considered ceremonially unclean. He was probably a different color person than Philip was. He came from a different background. He spoke different languages. He was from a different culture. Everything about him was different. And yet Philip shares the gospel with him, and he asks, well, why, why can't I be baptized? And Philip has one of those Scooby-Doo moments like, oh, you know, like, like he doesn't know why. And baptizes this man. Now, there's a couple of things that are interesting about this story. One is that this, this Ethiopian eunuch, like he was a searcher right? Like that really is what one of the things that stands out. Philip just didn't show up next to somebody who didn't know anything. No, the, the, you could tell that the eunuch was already searching to know the truth about God. Like there was a fire, of a spark within him already seeking the truth. And God simply recognized that spirit of searching and brought someone who could point him the way to Jesus, Right? And, and, like, I want you to imagine, like, Philip on his, like, he gets home, you know, he walks in the door. Hi, honey, how was your day today? You know, the first things out of his mouth are like, you are not going to believe what happened. You know, it sounds like a bad joke. Well, I met an Ethiopian eunuch on the road today. And baptized him. And you, the picture in Acts is this picture of an expanding gospel, right? Expanding. Expanding beyond imagination, expanding beyond like social and economic lines, expanding across peoples and cultures and tribes. And Paul, in prison, literally in chains, prays for that. He says, if you're going to pray for something, pray for open doors. Pray for many opportunities. Just be honest right now. In your prayers, all your prayers that you said this week, how many times did you pray for open door? In all your prayers, in all your praying, when was the last time you prayed, God, just give me a chance to share your truth with somebody else? The next verse, verse 4. Paul says just Pray that I will proclaim this message as clearly as I should. I want to make Christ visible. And, like, it's hard to, to get this, like, pray that I will proclaim this message as I should. But it, it is a way of saying that it's, it's an absolute necessity. Right? Like, pray that I will, I will lean into this, like, in a way that it's, it goes beyond duty. It's just a way that it must happen. No matter what is going on, no matter what, what is surrounding, no matter the circumstances, no matter the difficulties, pray that I will proclaim this message. Pray that we will be bold in proclaiming the truth of Jesus Christ. Verse 5 and 6 talk about uh, walking and talking. You can go ahead and put that next verse up there. Specifically related to like sharing this message and, and non-believers, Paul says, let me talk to you about how you walk and how you talk. He says, I want you to live wisely among those who are not believers. That, that live wise, wisely literally it translates in wisdom walk. In wisdom walk. And he says, when you conduct yourself, your, your whole life, like it's, it's more than just what happens on Sunday morning, but in your daily life, be incredibly wise and considerate among non-believers. 
Be considered among people and wise among people who don't know who Jesus is. And how you live, your actions affect how the world will see and receive the church and receive Christ. Two weeks ago, Paul tells the Colossians, he says, I I want you to operate under the umbrella of Christ as a representative of Christ. Everything you do represents Christ. Like how you brush your teeth represents Christ. Like how you floss, like, you know, that one time before you go to the dentist, you know, like, like, All of these things represent Christ. So be wise in how you walk and how you talk. In that next verse, he says, Let your conversations be gracious and attractive. Uh, A a good translation of that is uh, full of grace and salt. Um, I just use the the idea of, of salty grace. Like, I know it sounds like a Jimmy Buffett song, but like, yeah. He says, let your conversations be filled with salty grace. It's amazing to me that we can sometimes live and work next to people for years and years and years and never have a conversation with them that matters. I remember feeling this way when uh, early on, right after we moved into our home, the neighbor across the street from us, a, a, an awesome guy that, that we had met and talked to a few times, like, like he actually died, he passed away, and we didn't know about it till like weeks later. It's amazing to me that we can go through our lives without ever having conversations with somebody that matters. I've been reading uh, uh, Bob Goff's new book. Do you guys know who Bob Goff is? Crazy wild guy, like he's super ADHD and his writing is kind of that same way. It's kind of hard to read sometimes. But he's got a new book out right now called Dream Big. And in, a, in a, uh, one of the chapters of this new book, uh, the, the chapter title is Sea Otters. So you'll have to read it and figure it out for yourself. He talks about this idea of like how much time we're wasting with people, right? All of these, this time we're wasting with people. And he encourages a challenge, and I think it's a great challenge. He says, I want you to try to have 12 real conversations a day. 12 real conversations a day. Not, not how are you doing or where do you work or how's the weather. Like, holy cow, how much time have we spent talking about the weather? How much time have you spent talking about COVID-19, right? Like, you know, 12 real conversations a day. Conversations that go beyond the surface, that ask real things. Like, who are you? What are the things you really want in life? And how's it going Really? One of our, our favorite conversations, it was uh, uh, something I see in, in AA and NA a lot, is the high-low conversation. Have you ever had this? Hey, tell me you're high this week. Tell me you're low this week. You know, it, it goes a little bit deeper. I love the question, what are you passionate about? I told you last week about my ministry friend. He always, every single time I meet him, his very first thing, his very first question, question to me is always, what are you really thankful for this week? And I'm like, I hate the question. You know? Because it's so much easier to talk about the weather. So much easier to talk about what I'm frustrated about. What are you passionate about? What, who, who do you really admire and what are your dreams? When was the last time you laughed so hard you peed yourself? Like, these are the important questions of life. I asked you, I asked you a minute ago, when was the last time you, you prayed for opportunities? When was the last time you had a conversation that really mattered? That really mattered? You know what the truth I found is? That most people, even though they're thrown off guard when you go a little bit deeper with them, what I found is most people are waiting for someone to ask. Like that eunuch on the road, waiting for some help. 
waiting for someone to lean in in a way that is meaningful. And when Paul says, let your conversations be gracious and attractive, he says, quit being so boring, right? Like, I'm scared of, like, if somebody asked you about Aspen Grove, I'd be really scared of what you might say, right? So, like, is it gracious and attractive? Is it, is it engaging and life-giving, or is it bland and boring? Like, like, look, Scripture is filled with all kinds of stuff, right? Sometimes it's frustrating, sometimes it's exciting, sometimes it's challenging, sometimes it's engaging, but it is never, ever, ever boring. It's not. And if you're bringing something that's, that's somehow disengaging or boring to the faith, like you're doing a real, we are doing a real injustice to who God is and what he wants to accomplish in our world. Are you with me? So Paul says, it's time to spice it up, right? Is your conversations with people in your world, are they real? Do they matter? Are they engaging and tasteful and sustaining? Finally, and I'm almost done, the last part. He says, I want you to make the most of every opportunity. I want you to have the right response. You guys, maybe you remember in 1 Peter 3.15, it says, if someone asks you about your Christian hope, always be ready to explain it. Right? And it's that same language of, of absolute necessity, like this must happen. You have to be ready. There's no ifs, ands, buts, or ors about it. Like, it, it, it is something, it's deeply ingrained in you. It must happen. And that language of, I love this language, like, he says, make the most of every opportunity. It's, it's like, it's shopping language, really. Liter literally in the Greek, it, he says, buy up the time. Like a, like a product offered at a really great price. I can't read that well, like buy up the time, make the most of every opportunity without thinking about my mom. My mom is a shopaholic, right? Well, more easily stated, she is a deal-aholic. Do I have any deal-aholics in here? Yeah, there's some hands going up. Yeah, like uh, she, she created this thing that I have never heard of before in, in shopping and in commerce. Uh, she calls it a have to buy. A have to buy is something that is at such a great deal, such a great bargain, whether you need it or not, you have to buy it, right? Like I know some of you, I see some of our Ramsey folks are like, no, there's no such thing. Like, I know. She created something, it, it is a have to buy. And so she will always come home, and, and maybe you have this... <laughs> Look at your spouse if this is if you married this person that, that believes in this theory. The have to buy is like she's always coming home with something like, What is that, mom? What is that? What is that for? Do you and she's like, I don't know, but I had to buy it. You won't believe the deal I got on this. And my mom's radar for the have to buy never turns off. Uh, are you with me? You know what I'm saying? Like, it doesn't matter what kind of store we're in. It doesn't matter where we're at. She, her radar for the have to buy, for the amazing deal, is always on. She's always looking for that next opportunity. She's never not looking And when Paul tells the Colossians to buy at the time, that's what he means. Something inside, a, a compelling force that's always on the lookout. There's one more distinguishing trait about, really about Colossians chapter 4. And it comes in verse 18. 
Uh, most of Paul's writings in the New Testament were, were, were written by somebody else. Like he's, he's speaking it and they're recording it. But at the very end, he says in, in bold letters, here is my greeting in my own hand, Paul. Like so you know, so that you would know it was him. But he in, includes these three words and he includes it kind of throughout Colossians. But he includes the words, remember my chains. So that you would know where he is when he wrote this. And like, like in, in, in a very tangible sense, he, he holds his manacled hands up in front of the Colossian church. He shakes the chains in front of them. And the truth is, in Colossians, he's not shaking these chains as, as some sort of like cry for sympathy. He's, he's honestly, he's not asking for sympathy. He, he's not, again, you see, he's not praying for release. But when Paul holds his chains up, it is an appeal from authority. The, the sound of those chains is a call for obedience. The sound of those chains is, is an urging and a call to every Christian to re-enlist, to join the fight again. And so finally, as we wrap up, I just want to go through those highlights one more time. In your prayers today, in this moment, in this week, it's time to wake up. It's time to wake up and keep looking forward. Pray for opportunity. Pray for doors to be opened. Do you know that there are people in our world just like that eunuch on the side of the road that are searching for God, that are waiting for one person to simply lean in and share the truth with them. So pray for open doors. Pay attention to your walk and your talk. May your walk be wise and your talk be filled with salty grace. Pursue conversations that matter. You think you can do that today? Before you put your head on your pillow tonight, 12 conversations that matter, right? That's not going to happen by accident, right? You're not just going to go, man, wow, I can't believe I got myself into those conversations. You know, like, it's going to require real intention, And for Paul and for the Colossian church and for us, like this is a have to buy. It's an absolute necessity. Buy up the time. Be ready and be bold to act on every opportunity. May your radar never be turned off because the mission of God to grow followers of Jesus Christ, to make disciples, proclaiming the truth of Jesus Christ is always before us. Let's pray together. Father God, I thank you so much for your word, for its power and for its depth and for its meaning. And, and Father God, maybe we have been asleep to some of these things. Maybe instead of readiness, we've, we've taken on apathy. Maybe we've become way too comfortable on our couch. We've become way too, conversation, too, too comfortable with conversations that are plain. So, Father God, I ask for some flavor. I ask for some salt. I ask for some real intention. Father God, help us to be awake to what you're doing in this world. Help us to be awake to those around us who are seeking your truth. And God, God, we, we pray for those opportunities. God, I know maybe there are some people in this room right now and watching online that say, man, I'm not ready, I'm not ready, I'm not ready. God, man, put opportunities in front of them. And when the opportunity comes, help them to be bold. Help them to be bold. 
Father God, there's no guarantee about tomorrow, so help us to buy up the time today. Help us to share the truth of who you are with those around us. We love you, Father, and in your Son, Jesus' name, everyone together says, Amen.